Hello, everybody. Welcome to yet another fantastic episode of Wrestling Doesn't Make Sense. Our regular John is a little bit under the weather at the moment, so we have um, our a guest on today who was on um, one of our previous podcasts, uh, Corey. Hello, Corey. Hey. How are you? Ah, uh, not too bad. Excellent. Did you watch WrestleMania? All eight hours of it. I think it was like seven and a half. Yeah, it was a long time. Did you have a good time watching all seven hours of WrestleMania? <laughs> From what I can remember, I thought it was okay. Right. Now, this is what I wanted to talk about, basically. Is that I thought the show was okay. You know, I agree with, with, with that. I thought it was... It was good, but not great. You know, it was solid, but not spectacular. If you know what I mean. Like, yeah. I mean, if a show is going to be seven hours long, you kind of want... You, you want it to be really good to justify the length. Otherwise, you know, you're just watching seven hours of, of nonsense. And... I thought that some of the matches were good, but nothing great. Like, for example, before WrestleMania this year, I went back and was watching a couple of other, you know, uh, I think from 2004, WrestleMania, I watched, um, you know, Eddie Guerrero versus Kurt Angle. It's a classic match. You know what I mean? And um, a few weeks before that, I watched um, Shawn Michaels versus Reza Ramon in a ladder match. You know, you, there there are matches at WrestleManias that you would go back and watch because they were classics. And I, after watching this year's WrestleMania, didn't think that any of those matches would warrant a second viewing, if you know what I mean. Yeah. You know, n none of them were like five-star classics or anything like that. They were fun. And what was interesting about it was that a lot of the right people won. Yes. Which was cool. Um, you know, Becky won, although the finish of that match was weird. Mm -hmm. And not just because of the... Um, because Ronda kind of had her, her shoulders up. But I thought it was weird that the match ended just in a in a roll-up like that. In, yeah, in a crucifix. In a crucifix. Because it kind of came out of nowhere. Um, you yeah, know? I, uh, it was really... It kind of really took a lot of the wind out of the finish. Mm -hmm. Because, it, you know, like... I think this is, I saw someone saying that this was like the happy ending WrestleMania where all of the, uh, all of the heroes won at the end of the day. Yeah. But I think the endings to two out of the three are really underwhelming. And, you know, Becky, uh, the, the first ever, you know, women's main event of the, of WrestleMania that needed to have such a strong ending, such a like clear and defined, like iconic moment. Mm hmm. And catching Ronda on a crucifix was uh, just not the way to go. No. I I understand that, you know, uh, there was the conversation that I guess Ronda may not be coming back for a while. So it keeps her strong. And, you know, whenever she does come back, she can still say, you know, that you beat me on like a fluke roll up. Mm -hmm. And it also keeps Charlotte from getting pinned again just because you can easily use Charlotte as a, you know, a another opponent for Becky because they go against each other so frequently they're yes. pretty good rivals so I get the need to uh, for the way they wanted to do it but I think it just for storyline purposes they kind of needed to sacrifice one or the other right like some there, there needed to be a more kind of uh, definitive finish for um you know like it, it's all well and good to have Becky Lynch holding up both belts at the end of the night but there was nothing in it, like, you know, it just did kind of seem like a fluke pin. And that seems like a very strange way to to end a storyline that has been going for six months. SummerSlam? Yes, yeah, yeah. SummerSlam. You know, um, yeah, longer than six months. It's, it's a very strange way to kind of cap it off um, with, without that kind of definitive finish. So I thought that was interesting, but the match itself was was okay. Yeah, and it's it, fine. And like the problem I had, or the thing I noticed, and this is going to surprise nobody, but um, all of the matches after the Triple H match 
were a little bit shorter than I would have imagined them to be. How, <laughs> how strange that is. You know, like, I think if you give that uh, women's match an extra five minutes, that would have made all the difference. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, like, the, it would have really benefited. Because um, I felt like I was just getting into it, and then it ended. Um, and again, part of that might have been because some of the matches went on too long, and it was getting kind of too late in the day. But, um, yeah, I really, really would have liked that match to have gone on a little bit longer. But it was fine, you know. Um, Kofi Kingston versus Donnie Bryan, it was fine. It was a good yeah, match. it was fine. It wasn't amazing. It wasn't like, you know, holy shit, did you see that match? But it was fine. It did its job, and it was okay, you know. Um, yeah. The Seth Rollins match, I mean, that wasn't anything special at all. No, I have a lot of problems with the Seth Rollins match as well. Um, I I didn't I don't really care for the storyline going in of you know because uh, they've done it with Brock so many times like oh Brock Lesnar doesn't care about the you you know about the fans he he doesn't care about the company he's just here to make money and he he only shows up when he wants to and I think like does that make Brock a bad person? At the end of the day, it's like well he's getting paid a lot of money and only goes to work when he wants to go to work. I think that's what I mean. Many people would think is very desirable. Right. But um, it, my my problem with Seth had more to do with the actions in it. I understand, like, you know, Brock jumped him before the bell and just beat the absolute hell out of him. But at the end of the day, our hero, rather than, you know, uh, summoning up his, his fighting spirit and having a huge heart and, you know, uh, never say die attitude, he just kicked Brock Lesnar in the dick. Kicks him in the dick, yeah. Well, you know, I have such a problem with that. I have such a problem with that. Um, and, I, and I also have a problem with the idea that he had his finish three times and he didn't even attempt to go for a pin after the first one. Right. In 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 conjunction with the kick to the dick, you know, like that goes along with it too. It's like, how much more do you got to do to this guy to kind of put him down? Um, interesting that, I think it's interesting that both Brock Lesnar and The Undertaker have one mortal weakness, which is the testicles. Yeah. You know, kick them, kick them there, and they ain't getting up again. And I'm like, well, it's good to see that they both are human. Yeah. You know, that's nice. I think there was, there was like a, there was like a, a promo leading up into WrestleMania that it was like Seth versus Heyman with uh, Seth pointing out, saying like, oh yeah, you know, Brock's always, he, you know, who gave Brock his hardest fights were Finn Balor and AJ Styles and Daniel Bryan. He has a hard time against guys like me. And uh, Paul Heyman just probably was like, well, yeah, he beat them, though. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. But yeah, no, uh, the, the Seth Rollins-Brock thing, I did like how they, they just basically had Heyman, like, rush down the ring. He's like, listen, if we're not going to be in the main event, we're just going to get our shit done and get out of here. Yeah, that was nice. I thought that was, I thought that was clever. Yeah. But again, like the match wasn't anything spectacular, and it prob it could have been, I think, could have sure. been. Sure. But the, the the problem with having a seven hour long show is that it's incredibly hard to time a seven hour long show. Yeah, pacing's gonna be terrible. Right, it's gonna be so like when the shows were three hours, sometimes stuff would run long, and there would only be you know seven or eight matches on the card. And even then, you know, matches would have time to breathe and and develop, and they would still kind of run on long, which meant that other matches would have to get short. So if you're trying to organize a seven hour long show, like there's 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 a lot more that goes into that, and it's going to be a lot harder to to navigate through. So so yeah. So so the problem with that is the the reason that is their issue is. Um, I think that, I mean, it kind of goes without saying, the WWE has their rosters too big, and they have too many titles. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what it comes down to. And they have this desire to try to feature as many people on the show as possible, which is a good gesture. But, you know, how many of those matches, those tag title ma or those, you know, title matches were multi-man? You know, the women's title, the women's tag titles have only existed now for a few months, but they've only been defended once in a proper tag team match. Yeah. 
they were like in the elimination chamber to crown the winners, which still makes no sense to me why you would crown tag team champions in a match that tagging is not required. And then again at the WrestleMania with a fatal four way. Yeah, like I thought with the women's title match, a tag title match, I thought what they were going to do was, um, it seemed like they were teasing, you know, Beth Phoenix and Natalia, um, for WrestleMania, and I assumed that what they were really going to do was have Beth Phoenix and Natalia versus, um, Nia Jax and Tamina as like a way to kind of um, distract Nia Jax and Tamina from, you know, the actual tag team championships, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So that um, they could challenge for the belts next month or the month after that. Well, because it seemed like they were be- going to be built up as the, the legitimate forces in that uh, tag team division. And so the idea would be to have Sasha and Bailey kind of, get along fine with kind of, um, you know, their reign would kind of avoid Naya and Tamina for a little bit until eventually they did collide and the inevitable would happen, which would be them losing the belts. So I figured that's what was going to happen that then, and then the Iconics would fight Sasha and Bailey at WrestleMania. That's why I thought everything was going. And then... They thought, no, fuck it, we'll just stick it, stick, you know, instead of having two women's tag team matches on the card, that's ridiculous, we'll just make one, um, <laughs> which, you know, is what they did with the, the women's, cha- you know, singles championships as well, like, fuck having two women's matches on the card, we'll squish it down into one, um, which I didn't agree with, you know. Yeah. So if you if you want to take it like a like a structure, I mean, uh, do you want to kind of just touch on on every match in the order that they occurred in? Um. Well, I don't fuck. I don't remember the the order, so I'm just sure. kind of riffing. Like I keep sure. because because the friggin' show was seven hours long. Yeah. I um ended up. I will forgetting say. About some I of will them. say the one match that I thought had a brilliant story. That had next to no build was the revival versus uh, Kurt Hawkins and Zack Ryder. the the story The story in the match was brilliant. Uh, Kurt Hawkins has lost two hundred sixty nine matches in a row, hasn't won any. Uh, he spends the first part of the match getting absolutely just the crap kicked out of him by the revival. He tags out to Zack Ryder. Zack does well enough but then eventually he starts getting beaten up and it comes down to kurt has to be the one to win it for his team but he's not won a match in 269 different matches yeah i thought that was it was such a simple story but it was very good and everybody there played their roles magnificently and i think like that's the thing that a lot of wrestlemania misses is that it doesn't have a you know, you know, the stories don't have to be built up through months of promos and segments. It can just be simple like that, presented in that manner. Uh, the Cruiserweight title between Tony Nese and Buddy Murphy was very much the same way. They've been buddies throughout most of 205 Live. And, you know, now that Tony Nese had won the opportunity to challenge for him, Buddy wasn't taking him seriously. Because Buddy saw himself as the, uh, you know, the the talented one of their, of their friendship. Mm-hmm. Like I said, it doesn't always have to be complicated. It can, it can be something sim- simple. Um, talk about real simple, though. Uh, I did enjoy Samoa Joe tapping fucking Rey Mysterio out in, a, in like a minute and a half. Yeah. Um, yes. Another match that was after the um, the Triple H match, which I am pretty sure was um, not supposed to be that short. Well, I think it might have been just because uh, there had been all those stories that Rey Mysterio was injured the 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 night like a couple of days before, mm-hmm. so maybe it was intended to be a shorter match to kind of give it easy on him. But uh, Triple H having his big Fury Road entrance <laughs> and his <laughs> long plotting hardcore match that he wrestled as a heel the entire time. Yet he was I mean, Dave Batista got the crack kicked out of him, and uh, at one point there was a little bit of torture porn with uh, Hunter ripping his nose ring out with a pair of needle nose pliers. 
Well, look, before we get too into the Triple H match, which we will, um, I think that all of the matches, like I said this before, but really, if you look at all of the matches after the Triple H match, they all seem like they suffered from a lack of time. You know, Rey Mysterio versus Samoa Joe, you could argue that it was over so quickly because Rey was injured, but it, it, I don't know, it seemed pretty quick. Kurt Angle versus Baron Corbin may as well have not happened. Like, you know, it, they didn't have enough time to do anything interesting. And I don't know if either of them could be able to put on um, anything that interesting anyway. No offense to Kurt Angle, who is amazing, or was amazing, is what I'm going to say about that. Um, you know, Finn Balor versus Bobby Lashley. Oh, that one was just forgettable. Right, but that that was just over so quickly. You know what I mean? Like, they didn't get a chance to do anything interesting. Um, Lashley versus Finn Balor, very forgettable. But really, like, Kurt Angle versus Baron Corbin was very forgettable too. And, yeah. and that was Kurt Angle's final match. People said that they didn't want Kurt Angle's final match to be against Baron Corbin because it wasn't worthy of his caliber or whatever. Like, that didn't that didn't bother me because it's Kurt Angle. He's already had, like, a Hall of Fame career. He's already done all this stuff. Him losing to some idiot on the way out isn't going to ruin that career. It's just, no, I mean, and that's how it's done. You you retire on your back, you know. Right. You, you put over, you're supposed to put over somebody before you go. Right. It I mean, that's just, you build up the next person in line. And, you know, Baron Corbin has, I'm not a huge fan of the guy. He gets a lot of hatred. Yes, he does. Uh, but, you know, the guy needs some feathers in his cap. I mean, right now he's, what is he most known for? Being the last guy to screw up money in the bank. Right. Having a having a authority angle that was so bad the ratings plummeted. Yeah. Well, for I need something. Well, like the thing is, like having him lose, having him beat Kurt Angle is okay if they keep the pressure on Byron Corbin. If you know, if they have him beat Kurt Angle and then they forget about him, then it's this all for nothing. You know what I mean? Well, I mean that's a that's a very real possibility. Uh, that WWE brings people up to forget about him. They made a huge deal about bringing up those six NXT signees, and none of them have done anything. Right, that was a real shame. Um, I think Lacey. I think Lacey is the only one to have done something, and I think Lars Sullivan just came back in a big way. Yeah, but like, here's the thing: Lars Sullivan was away because you know he had like that anxiety problem, which mm-hmm. I feel for that. You know, so he's only just coming back now. And, you know, he's made a big impact already, right? Yeah. But he was supposed to debut in February with those other guys, right? Yeah. So you look God, at... God, was it February? Yeah. It seems like it was so much longer ago. So, so you look at the time between now and then, you know, Lars Sullivan hasn't been there for any of that and has still made more of an impact than EC3 or Heavy Machinery, who have been here and just haven't been used right. Yeah. Well, so the, what happened with that is, um, I don't, I can't tell you what happened with EC3. That one's kind of an anomaly to me. It doesn't make any sense. There's rumors that he's, you know, got in trouble backstage, but those are rumors, and I don't really care about those. Heavy Machinery was doomed from the start for the sheer fact that they were a tag team. The WWE, not a fan of tag team wrestling. Mm-hmm. Even now with, you know, uh... I mean, for example, like the Usos basically live with those SmackDown belts because I don't think, you know, while they are talented, I don't think anyone really cares. You know, I think they just lost them to the Hardy Boys yeah. what, this week. Yeah. And then the Hardy Boys got the shit kicked out of them by Lars Sullivan. So, you know, proof <laughs> once again, they don't care about tag team wrestling. So the right. worst thing that you can do is come up from NXT as part of a tag team. Yeah. Well, what's... Because they, they always go back to the well. The Usos, the Bar, the Hardys, the New Day. Right. They've had tons of tag teams come in, but those are the only four they ever use. What's dumb about that is that they brought up Heavy Machinery from NXT without really giving them a chance to do something. Same as Sanity. They brought them up, but they didn't do anything with them. And I'm like, well, why didn't you leave them where they were, where they could have done something? And they had well, the so I'm a huge Sanity fan because I'm a huge fan of Eric Young. Yes. And uh, I, uh, I'm real bummed out about that because... That group was a big deal in NXT. They were part of the first war games. They always had an angle going on. And for them to come up and just do 
nothing. I mean, that li- is yeah. such a bummer. Literally and the fact nothing. that they, they, for no real reason, they broke Nikki Cross away from them. Well, wasn't it a good thing they did that? Because look what Nikki Cross is doing now. Nothing. You know? Right. The same as Sandy, <laughs> so they may as well have kept them together. Yeah, at least let it be nothing, the four of them together, because they, you know, they do seem that they have a a great amount of chemistry with one another. Right. I mean, that, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that's the one that really surprised me. I think of all the people they they called up in that sixth batch, I thought Nikki was the one that was going to stand out the most. She's the one, she's on the women's division, and she has such a clear and defined gimmick that's like no one else is around them. But she's not conventionally attractive at least not in the gimmick they've given her so she's not going to get a push even like even becky the rebel comes out with you know super done up extension hair and you know makeup that is i don't know i the way they do the women's makeup is kind of cartoonish at times okay ronda rousey's got a black swan thing going on nine times out of ten i don't know what the hell i don't know who she pissed off in that makeup chair but they they do her wrong a lot Okay. I mean, I'm not really going to comment on the makeup of the women too much cuz I I'll be honest with you, I don't know a whole lot about makeup. That's that can that can be your area of expertise. <laughs> I have I'm friends with a lot of women and drag queens, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have paid attention to makeup a few times. <laughs> okay. Uh fair enough. Um but yeah, I think like it's just the problem is they don't, they have they have such a big roster. Like the yes. roster is huge and it's stacked. the The amount of talent on that roster is unbelievable. They have so so many good guys, and Jinder Mahal. <laughs> they, have, they have. He made it to like the final five of that fucking battle royal. <laughs> right. But nobody gives a shit about that either. So. No. Well, and what got me is that it was, and this is such a weird thing to notice, but I did. It was very raw, heavy battle royal. I didn't see a lot of SmackDown guys in that battle royal. Um, That's a weird point to make, but it was the truth. Well, I don't know how much attention I was paying to that battle royal. So. Well, I mean, with I mean, the final three years, when it was all just an angle to put Braun Strowman with Saturday Night Live people. Yeah, you know, what a good way to build up your monster on your on your roster is to have him manhandle two guys who aren't wrestlers. You yeah. Know, well, I think smart. the one that really upset me was when they brought in a therapist. It's like, hey, you know, maybe anger isn't the best way. Maybe you should, like, talk things through. And then Braun just beat up the therapist. I was like, oh, that's not a great message to send to people. <laughs> because there's a lot of bad messages that got sent out at WrestleMania. Like, if you can't beat him, kick him in the penis. Mm-hmm. And fuck therapy, beat up your problems. <laughs> well, yes. But I would I would say only really if you're like seven feet tall and you have a big beard. Yeah. Then you can get away. In a in a questionable mohawk ponytail combo. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with his hair. You know, that's but that's that's a whole other thing. You know, I'm not gonna go up to Braun Strowman and say, "Dude, what the fuck is up with your hair?" You know, because he would he would beat me like a therapist. He do. <laughs> I I can do like that. I do like that. So I guess one th- I want to bring up two people because I know you have very strong emotions about them. Oh, uh, Dylan, Dylan, <laughs> Dylan, what did you think of uh, Shane McMahon versus The Miz? I'm going to tell you this, and um, this is not going to surprise you, but I did not watch that match. What happened was... <laughs> I, had a feeling you, you, I had a feeling you skipped that one. Well, here's the thing, right? You know, by the time that match came on, we were kind of like the halfway point-ish and WrestleMania. Yeah, we'd already watched for a day and a half. Right. So I kind of took that time to um, I um, I left the audio on because I knew that given that it was a Shane McMahon match at WrestleMania, that the end of the match was going to be the only bit that was going to be worth seeing. Yeah. Like a hundred percent. You know, they could do all the other guff that they want to do, but I know that it's going to end with Shane McMahon jumping off a thing. So I, all I needed to do was pay attention to the end. So I would leave the audio on and I kind of browse the internet to kind of clear my head and get myself back into the mood for watching another six and a half hours of wrestling, you know. Um, so I, I didn't pay attention to that match, which will surprise everybody who has listened to this podcast and has realized my opinions on The Miz. Um, but like, that was a match I wasn't at all interested in anyway. And I think that 
for them to devote so much time to that match as well. Like, that match went on way too long. Yeah. For sure. Like, I... The reason I stopped watching it, because it started off with Shane McMahon throwing those weak-ass punches. And most of the time, I'm okay with, with Shane McMahon throwing, like, his silly-looking punches, because they don't look that bad. But they really look bad in this match. And so yeah. I was just like, no, this will do. I don't have to watch this. I'll be okay. Um, and so anybody listening can try and change my mind. They can try and tell me that The Miz versus Shane McMahon is the best match on the card. If it is the best match on the card, then they fucked up because that does not sound like a, a appealing match at all. Um, but yes, I, I do not have, have high opinions on this one. Well, and then we had that weird moment where Miz's dad got in the ring and he and Shane had a little face-off. I mean, it's such a common thing, a common complaint to make, but WrestleMania truly is a celebration of nepotism in that Shane McMahon had a big, long match and then Triple H had a big, long match. Yeah. And, yeah, and the finish to it, I, I don't, I'm sure you saw the finish because you were commenting upon it, but... I both liked it and disliked it. I mm. liked it because I thought it was, you know, clever. You know, Miz hits this ridiculous spot, but just the way he lands and he sacrificed himself to make it. You know, Shane McMahon on a technicality got the win just because he was laid on top of him. Mm -hmm. But it also made the Miz look like a fucking idiot because there were so many other ways he could have thrown Shane McMahon off a scaffold. Vertical suplex probably not going to be the one I think of first. What a bizarre choice. I know, like, I don't know, man. A running drop kick could have done the same thing. You could have just shoved him. That right. could have worked, too. He could have just fucking pushed him, and he would have fell. <laughs> and, instead, and, and instead, he has to hit, like, a superplex. <laughs> it was pretty stupid, you know? Um, I'm, not, I'm not just saying this because The Miz was involved, but like, like you said, that's a really idiotic kind of way to finish that match. So the second person I want to ask you about is, because uh, I know you have very strong feelings about them as well, as I feel most people uh, do, uh, what do you think about Asuka in the Battle Royal? Oh, okay. Um, yes, it's no secret that I love Asuka as much as I hate The Miz. Not, I was not so happy to see Asuka um, not win the Battle Royale. I mean, it wasn't too bad because... Um, Asuka, you know, winning the, the battle, female battle royale at WrestleMania isn't a big deal anyway. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's the thing is those battle royals, nothing ever comes of them. Right. Like, her not winning isn't too bad because it's a battle royal. You know, not winning a battle royale isn't, um, isn't a big deal because there's lots of moving parts and it's, it's totally logical that you know, on any given day, you could be thrown out of the ring by somebody else. So, that wasn't a big deal. Nice to see Carmella win. You know, I think Carmella's done a really good job um, kind of making a name for herself uh, and, and showing that she can actually move. And she's not the best wrestler in the world, but she can talk and she can work. So, you know, I'm... Uh, I, will, I will say this because... I. I think we we're at a point where we can stop doing the this person hides under the ring throughout the majority of the match and then pops up at the very end. <laughs> because that happened during the Women's Royal Rumble, yep. the Men's Royal Rumble, and it even happened at the Ring of Honor New Japan show. Oh, God. Where, some, where someone hid under the ring throughout the most of the match only to pop up and win. So I think, I think it's time... We let that one go, and someone try to come up with something different. Yeah, that uh, seems like a staple for battle royals. You know? I remember uh, Lucha Underground. They had a they had one of their uh, battle royal elimination style matches, and Joey Ryan just handcuffed himself to a railing. I mean, you can't pin him because he's you know you can't lay down, and you can't throw him over the top rope because he's stuck in a fixed position. True. Maybe somebody handcuffs himself to the bottom rope. That sounds like the smartest thing Joey Ryan has ever done. <laughs> It's not saying too much, is it? No. Well, actually, no, that's nonsense, because I think uh, at some engagement recently, he was charging people $30 to grab his dick, so, I mean... Right. I was going to ask I mean, you that's, about that. That's easy money. That's almost, like, three people do it? That's 100 bucks that you didn't previously have. That's fucking brilliant. That is sleazy money, my friend. That is, I believe, technically prostitution. 
I mean, <laughs> I don't know. It just depends on if they're getting sexual gratification out of it. You can you can touch my dick if you pay me. It sounds a little bit uh, prostitute to me. A little, little bit. bit, you know. I um, I was gonna ask you about that because I had heard that and I thought that that was an April Fool's joke. Nope, because that was legit. I was like, it's the kind of thing he would do if it's an April Fool's joke. That's funny. Ha ha ha. If he really is charging people thirty dollars to to for the privilege of touching his dick, then I think he is an idiot. And so here's so here's the thing. Um, I like Joey Ryan. Uh, I guess I can throw a, a past tense on there because I think Joey Ryan's actually very very good at what he does. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that ever since he went to DDT in Japan and started doing sexy Eddie's old, you know, I have a really strong penis that can throw you bit. Yeah. Uh, because he, that was actually, that was done by a, a guy out of Montreal, Canada back in the mid two thousands. Joey kind of lifted it. I mean, he, he kind of gave him some props for it recently by booking him on his WrestleMania show. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that, that's not even an original Joey Ryan idea, but, um, it's intelligent. It's the, it's very Brock Lesnar in that like, Oh, People will pay me even more money to not put as much effort into like physical effort and strain into into this. Like I can like make more money and not have to work as hard. So I mean, it's smart, but I assume not a thing. Yeah. Well, yeah. In that respect, it's smart, but also like even if somebody else had done it before, I'm like, well, then that guy's an idiot. You know, if it was yeah. just, if it was just like a one time thing, that would have been funny and awesome, and we would have got over it. But now it's like. It's Joey Ryan's thing. It's like he's yeah. got he's got to do the dick plex at every match he's in, and I'm like, I don't want to watch that because it doesn't make any sense, and it's just not appealing. To be, it's just yeah, you know. no, no, I get it, I get it. I mean, that's every and it's it's funny because whenever you bring that up as a like a criticism, I don't really enjoy that kind of thing. You have the people who throw it out. It's like, well, it's an art form, and you know you. You know, you can't critique art. It's, well, you can critique you, you art. You totally can, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you absolutely can critique art. I mean, and that's that's not... It, to suggest that what everything that everyone does in professional wrestling is art, that's, <laughs> that's right. an interesting choice. <laughs> well, like, I have this whole... Um, I had this argument as well because um, I was talking to somebody about modern art and this guy had, had made a painting, and the painting was just of a little square. It was like a big white canvas, but there was a little, I think it was like a red square in the middle of the canvas. And the argument we were having was that my friend was saying that that was art. And I said, it's not art, it's a square. And he said, oh, it is, it's modern art, it's, it's, it's interesting. And I'm like, it's not, it's just a square. Like, anybody could do that. His argument was... Yes, but he did it first. He was the first one. I'm like, <laughs> but that doesn't, ma- that doesn't mean that it's good or that it qualifies as art. A square on a canvas doesn't qualify as art just because somebody did it first. You know what I mean? Like, so so here's the so here's the thing. I would I would agree and disagree with him. I would agree that what makes something art is what is put into it. What is if he's able to sing like come across a message or get across a point or an idea in that little square, I would say that's art. But for to suggest that it's art just because somebody did it first is fucking absurd. Because that's it's just seen, like right? did, did Isaac Newton do art when he, you know <laughs> when he uh came up with the you know laws of physics? Is no, that but, art? Because he but was no, the first one to to come up with that? The argument was yeah, the argument was just just, just because nobody else thought about putting a little square on a big canvas and calling it art. And I'm like, yeah, but that's because everybody else has sense. Everybody else isn't a fucking idiot, you know? <laughs> and I think, no offense to Joey Ryan, because, like, it, he's good at his gimmick, if you know what I mean. Like, like yeah. I, I dig that, and he seems like a smart guy. But, like, there, there's a good reason why other people aren't doing the dick plex. It's because it's a fucking stupid thing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and like you said, we I mean, we kind of got off the beaten path with <laughs> WrestleMania oh, on this, but but yeah, no, I that's the thing is I have very complicated feelings about it because um, I I do know that he's he when he actually does wrestle, it's really good. 
Like he's very seamless. He's he's been doing this for a very long time. Mm-hmm. But the, uh, I mean, the gimmick's the gimmick, I and mean, people pay him a stupid a lot of money. It's kind of like my feelings on like the Young Bucks uh, in you know Cody Rhodes and the AEW stuff. Yes, where they're they wrestle very like all of their matches are very fucking silly for the most part. Yeah, like uh, I've been to Ring of Honor shows with you know when they were still there and. They would, uh, I remember they did this one show where they like stopped the match because it was Frankie Kazarian and, and Cody Rhodes were like locking up and they ended up cutting like a commercial for the cigar company they owned. And it's just like, oh, if we reference stuff from our YouTube series, you know, people eat that up. And it, I, I, I'm not a fan of that. You know, I'm not, a, I, I don't really know where I'm going with this, to be frank. But I guess that's what I'm getting at is, yes, I, I see the point. I see why people pay the money for it. And uh, I, I'm just not crazy about it personally. Right. Like As that's... long as people are still going to throw money at him. To, you know, as long as people are still putting down money to go watch Joey Ryan make someone grab his penis and then you know pretend to throw them across the ring, they're going to still book him to do that. Right. That's a whole other thing, which fits in perfectly, really, with the, the kind of young bucks, like you're saying. They they have that same kind of philosophy, where they're like, wrestling isn't about, you know, um, making it look like a competitive sport anymore, because we all know that it's not. It's more about having fun, and it's more about kind of, um, you know, doing fun, silly stuff that'll entertain the crowd. But I'm like... I, I kind of get that, but at the same time, if the fun, silly stuff you're doing isn't fun or silly and it's just there to kind of pop yourselves, because I feel like a lot of the stuff the Young Bucks do is to get a pop out of themselves or the boys, you know what I mean? And um, or it, it doesn't seem like it's that entertaining. I think a lot of smarks are, are, are eating it up, um, and I don't think that's the kind of thing that has a lot of long-term... No, no. Longevity. Well, I mean, I, I guess it's my, uh, you know, I, I also think it's very, um, it's very pretentious mm-hmm. for the, for their little catchphrase to be, we're you know, ch- we're gonna change the world it, with you know doing jerk off you know YouTube bits and parodies. <laughs> right. I guess that's that's being very big on yourself. But I will say that one of the more amusing things I've ever seen, and this is just me being spiteful, I suppose. Um, I'm a big fan of Lucha Libre. Mm-hmm. I watch a, I, I do watch a lot of AAA and CMLL, and uh, Cody and the Young Bucks showed up at a AAA show to crickets because nobody <laughs> in Mexico gives a fuck about the Young Bucks. <laughs> oh man, maybe I should go to Mexico. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because that's the thing, and it's really funny because like the big draw in AAA is this guy called Psycho Clown, whose gimmick is that he's a clown. Mm-hmm. And he got huge pops and cheers, and I think he ended up having to come out with Cody Rhodes to kind of like, hey, everybody, you may not know who this guy is, but he's cool with Psycho Clowns, so that means he's cool with you. Nice. By the way, at some point, this is something that everybody gets to, to look forward to, but I'm sure that whenever All Elite Wrestling becomes more of a thing, you and me will be doing a podcast about this. Because... <laughs> about, about how we were both rather judgmental of it <laughs> right but i have a feeling that you know history is going to be on our side um at the end of that we could talk at length about um our opinions on all of sure. the wrestling and how great they are as a t-shirt company <laughs> a great t-shirt company have you seen all their t-shirts they're really good at they fly t-shirts. off the shelves because oh, their fans yes. will buy fucking anything right but it's bizarre to me that they can sell so much and yet have so little. Nothing. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, that's the thing that got me is that they're, they announced the company and then like, oh, their t-shirts are the best selling t-shirts on this whole website. Like, holy hell, like that was, this could blow up spectacularly, you know, and I, you're, you're, uh, do you watch a lot of like Premier League? Um, you mean football? Yes. Or soccer, I suppose, is, is the emergency. Well, that's why I wanted to call it Premier League. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't. My brother watches a lot of it, but I, I wouldn't really watch too much of it. Well, so the guy who, who is funding AEW is also a part of the family that owns uh, 
a Premier League team, uh, a club. Uh, I can't remember what team it is, but their fan base absolutely fucking hates them. Uh, <laughs> absolutely hates them, and I'm just and I, I I was on a message board, and people were talking about it, and they're like, "Yeah, if they run, you know, this professional wrestling company the same way they're running this soccer, this uh, sorry, this football club, yes, uh, their the AEW fans probably won't be very thrilled for very long." Okay, hang on. It's Tony Khan is the name of the guy, right? Yeah. And Fulham. Fulham, yeah, Fulham. Oh, okay. Uh, understandable. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. I yeah, get yeah, it. yeah. He, he, like, he, like, what? Hired a, like, signed a bunch of guys that his, uh, like, his staff said, no, 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 they're not, they're a terrible fit for the team. That's not what we need. But he, he signed them anyway. Mm-hmm. He, like, raised ticket prices even though the team's not doing well. Well, like, let, let's put it this way. You know, like, Fulham... Um, well, like I said, I'm not a big kind of football fan or, or soccer, if you will. Um, mm-hmm. But, like, my, my brother is, so I, I know about kind of, you know, little, little ins and outs and stuff like that. And um, Fulham are not one of the teams you would talk about whenever you're talking about real classic, you know... Um, Teams that have kind of made runs for the championship and 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 are are good, if you know what I mean. They yeah. haven't really like done a whole lot um, to challenge the mainstays, which would be you know your Chelsea's, your your uh, Manchester United, your Liverpool, you know Arsenal, you know the 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 big names. If if you see where I'm going with this, yes. Um, basically, what I'm saying is. Uh, yes, if if he runs his wrestling company like he runs his football club, we are we are going to be proven correct. Well, and we'll also, and I mean, I'll throw out an American football reference for you as well. He also owns the Jacksonville Jaguars, uh, which is why AEW have all their little things in Jacksonville. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Jacksonville Jaguars also historically not great. Wow. <laughs> so he's managed to have a you know a mediocre to failing football club in two different sports and yet he has a squillion pounds or dollars I yeah should man say. he's a squillion dollars um isn't that just weird my my point is that at some point we will be doing a lot more talk about a all elite wrestling and you know joey ryan and all that stuff so yeah if, if you want we can go back to talking about triple h because uh, you know i'm sure his ego would, would prefer that well, so if we can, uh, if we can kind of talk about, uh, yeah, let's go with uh, the women's tag match. We kind of talked about it with Beth Phoenix and uh, Natalia, but okay. you know the the Iconics are the team that you know sneaks out a win, and they're the yes. second you know women's tag t- tag champions. Do you have any thoughts on the Iconics? Yes, I have lots of thoughts on the Iconics. Uh, I, I I saw a lot of people talk about how this WrestleMania was good because, um, you know, the right people won, like the fan favorites won. So, yeah, everybody was talking about, you know, Becky winning and Kofi winning and um, uh, Seth Rollins winning as being these big kind of mark out moments. But for me, honestly, like, the I probably marked out more watching um or seeing the iconics win i really did i was like holy shit they fucking did it because yeah. i love the iconics i I, am, I do too i i think they're they're very underutilized in nxt yes and uh, and i've noticed that's like the common theme in uh in the wb is that the underutilized people from nxt tend to do better than the people who were big deals there because Elias as the drifter Elias didn't do shit in NXT for the most part right but he's like you know gets his own special in-ring segments and interacts with John Cena and the Undertaker on Raw I mean well yeah do you notice that it seems to it I think it's it's certainly a theme that um, that the women from NXT have been doing that for example you know, we said Carmella, she came up, she did a really good job, but in NXT, she was just fucking the hairdresser for Enzo and Kaz. Um, Alexa Bliss, nobody thought she could wrestle. Turns out she fucking is incredible. Um, yeah, she was just managing Murphy and uh, Wesley Blake. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. On, on NXT, she wasn't doing a whole lot, you know. Um, 
and even Lacey Evans didn't really do a whole lot on NXT. Now they, they brought her up because they want to give her some kind of push. We'll see how that goes, you know? Yeah. But it seems like they're kind of taking a lot of chances with people from NXT on the female side that they hadn't really, you know, given a chance to before. So I was very happy to see the Iconics win because um, I think that they're, they're one of the few proper teams in, in the, the women's tag team division. Um, they, 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 they're they so good at being heels. Like, they're so good. Um, they're, they're, they're... Oh, yeah, yeah. They're, they're... <laughs> they have a lot of really weird energy. Uh, I think... Yeah. Uh, so my, my uh, fiancé, uh, she's a big wrestling fan. Uh, she watches a lot of Japanese stuff primarily. But she loves the Iconics because, you know, she stated that they're... Uh, they're very attractive, you know, uh, women, but traditionally you would see them just having a gimmick like, oh, you know, she's kind of like a, a mean girl bitch. Oh, she's you know yeah. sexy or whatever. But like, they're very silly. Yes. You know, they're very over the top. Yes. I love the, the exaggeratedness of, of both of them. They're very, they're, they're very annoying, but in a, in a very like kind of sweet, endearing way, if, if that makes any sense. But like their their annoyingness and their shrillness like kind of plays to their strength um and like yeah I, you, you could have easily seen both of them work in a kind of um snooty kind of gimmick where they're you know heels but they're better than everybody else whereas the iconics are just these these two they're a little cowardly you know they're yes. a little annoying they're a little sneaky and and, and they pull it off really well really well so I was super, super happy to see the Iconics win because um, I didn't think it was going to happen. Like, I really thought that um, um, Sasha and Bailey would retain, but I... I was, yeah, I mean, I was really happy that they didn't. Um, I'm, I'm not a fan of Sasha and Bailey um, at all, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that a lot of it has to do with... I think a lot of the other tag teams in the women's tag divisions have better chemistry than those two, but they were the ones who were pushed, you know, real hard because they were the two bigger names. Mm-hmm. But, you know, look at the Riot Squad, look at Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville, look at the Iconics. They were kind of an afterthought when the belts are first introduced. And, and you know, the other, t- the other two, aside from the Iconics, still are. But they have better chemistry than, you know, Naya and Tamina, and they have better chemistry than Sasha and Bailey, and better chemistry than... Beth Phoenix and you know Natalia. Well, Beth Phoenix and Natalia get on pretty well, I think. Well, yeah, I mean they they are, but I mean there was also you know the Beth Phoenix had been in a ring in what ten years. Yeah, maybe maybe as you know probably less, but but yeah, like like I said, those other teams I think have better chemistry. I'm very surprised to not see the Riot Squad kind of be in there and be involved more because they are a good team and they're they're a bunch of kids that can really. You know they'll go far. I think the all three of those. Oh yeah, I I saw Ruby Riot when she was still in the Indi- in Independence. Uh, I saw her live in Cleveland before, and she's really good. And it's just a, it's always such a shame because you know not everybody can be the featured player. And I think that there are some some members of the WWE roster that I think are also kind of learning this if their social media accounts are any indication. Yeah. yeah. They're coming to that realization that maybe they aren't going to be the, the top featured person. Yes. But um, with Ruby, I do think that's kind of a shame because I think Ruby's really good. And a lot of those matches they put her in on one-on-one occasions, like I was at Fastlane last year where mm-hmm. she faced off with Charlotte for the SmackDown Women's title. Mm-hmm. And that was a great match. Yeah. Well, here's the thing, man. Like, I think... I think there's some people that you just kind of, um, if they just put the time in, eventually it'll all work out, you know, like they might not be the, the very tip top of the, of the company, but like, for example, Natalia, I've been a big fan of Natalia's for a long time and I was very happy to finally, you know, whenever she finally kind of got to make a name for herself because she was in the company for a while and for a long time she wasn't doing anything or she would just be managing you know, Cesaro and Tyson Kidd or something, you know, she, yeah. she wasn't really doing a whole lot. So uh, whenever she does get a chance to kind of go out there and shine and, you know, I, I love it. And like, she's a, you know, former Divas champion, a former SmackDown uh, women's champion. 
you know, she was at WrestleMania competing for SmackDown or for the women's tag team championships. Like she's she's doing well for herself. Even though a lot of people would look at a career like that and think that it's not, you know, picture perfect because she's not on top all the time. I think that she has been rewarded for her, uh, you know, her, her abilities. And I think that's the kind of thing that I could easily uh, see for, for somebody like, like Ruby Riot. I think if she kind of sticks with it, because she's a good hand in the ring. She's very good, much like Natalia. Yeah. And she's there to kind of make other people look good, which, is, which she does. And she's very good at that, too. So I think it's only yeah. a matter of time before, um, before she gets like the kind of payoff, you know. Like she, she definitely will. The problem is like right now she has to compete with Becky and Charlotte and, um, you know Ronda Rousey and and all of these other guys. But I think if she sure. just, if she just plays the game, she waits waits a little bit. She's gonna she's gonna get you know the good stuff. So so I'm gonna throw a sports analogy at you that you may not get because I just don't know how much about basketball you may know i know everything but, about basketball all right man glad to hear it because you're, you're gonna pick up on this easily <laughs> um so um during the 90s there were all these really amazing basketball players uh you know there was um john stockton out of utah there's patrick ewing out of new york charles barkley who was you know uh, he bounced around a couple different places uh chris mullen out in golden state but a lot of those guys never won an NBA title because they had the misfortune at being in the league at the same time as Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, yeah. So that's kind of how I view a lot of the WWE roster. There's a lot of really good people out there, but you know, especially in the women's division, they just have the misfortune of being around at the same time as Charlotte Flair and Becky Lynch. Right, and and you know, it's, it's logically that. Not everybody's going to be able to to be able to get to that point right now, and yeah. um, but I think that it's just a matter of time, especially for somebody like Ruby Riot because she's so talented. I think that that's a matter of time, and she's definitely gonna if she plays the game a little bit, she'll be able to get up there pretty soon. You know. Well, and I think this is something that I the WB has really moved away from. Um, they're they don't build up challengers per month anymore. They've gotten so accustomed to these long-term storylines. Like, how many times have we seen Finn Balor versus Bobby Lashley? How many times have we seen Drew McIntyre and, the, and Roman Reigns faced off at some combination of The Shield and whoever McIntyre's hanging out with? How many times have we seen, you know, um, for example, The Revival versus Bobby Roode and Chad Gable? Yes. There are other teams. Yes. Exactly. There are other competitors out there. But we don't see those. We don't, you know, uh, whereas there would usually be a new challenger every month. You know, somebody, you know, let's say D'Lo Brown versus, you know, X-Pac. Mm -hmm. They have their match and whoever wins, they move on to feud with Val Venus next. There's not a lot of that. And I think that's what hurts when they have a roster so big, but they keep using the same people repetitively. Like right. you would think that the raw roster is only like 20 people based off of any given episode of Raw. Right. Exactly. Like if you watch an episode of Raw, you can you can you can pick out your regular guys, the guys who always get T V time. I'm like, well if you've got three hours to spare, how come you can't give a little bit more T V time to some of these other guys who really could benefit from it, you know? Yeah, I know that they're putting the, I I heard they're putting these matches out on network soon. But they did this event during WrestleMania weekend called Worlds Collide, mm -hmm. where they just had a lot of their their underutilized talent from all the different brands. So NXT UK, 205, uh, Raw, SmackDown, and NXT just facing off each other in matches. And from what I understand, they were really good. Like uh, they had Killian Dane and Alexander Wolfe versus Bobby Fish and Kyle O'Reilly. Uh, they had Luke Harper versus Dominic Dijogovic. So like that, I think they could benefit from doing something like that i mean once upon a time they had main event superstars for things like that sunday night heat and velocity shotgun saturday night yeah. you know all of those little small shows where you could feature the lower mid card guys they mm -hmm. don't really do that anymore like they have main event but you know main event is what two matches and then a raw recap well, i mean that's what those shows usually were they usually were a recap mm -hmm. but they could do a lot more with some of their talent I mean, it's just weird, but it feels like the company, like, just, it, they pay people just so they don't go somewhere else. 
Right. I mean, this was my criticism of of the booking of WrestleMania for this year was that um, they had this they 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 specifically created the two battle royals, you know, to to get more people onto the show so that people would get their WrestleMania payday, and despite to specifically creating matches to get as many people on the show as possible, they still ended up having 16 fucking matches at the show. Like, how many more people have to go into this show? You know, it doesn't need to be seven hours long. You know, a lot of this stuff doesn't need to happen. This coming year, uh, in 2020... Uh, New Japan is going to be doing something a little different. So New Japan's WrestleMania is called Wrestle Kingdom, Mm -hmm. and it takes place in January. So it's kind of the same deal. The one night a week, and then uh, their Raw after SmackDown is a show that follows this. That's the next night called New Year's Dash. And New Year's Dash is usually where, like, the big new character or the big new storyline comes together. Um, Next year, they're doing away with New Year's Dash by the looks of it and just having Wrestle Kingdom as two nights. And I think maybe that's something WrestleMania can do. Instead of having WrestleMania's one night, maybe have two nights. Yeah. I remember uh, Lucha Underground, their big show, Ultima Lucha. They broke it up into two episodes. And that way you get you can really say this is WrestleMania weekend because it's a show on Saturday and a show on Sunday. And I think it, you know, it could help spread it out. It could help make the show shorter. Right. I think that if you're going to make your show like seven hours long, you really need to split it up because then you can have, you know, SmackDown Championship headline in one night and the Raw Smack or Raw Heavyweight Championship defended as the main event the next night. And, you know, it, it would work a lot better. It would be a lot smoother because it's tough to sit through a seven-hour show. Oh, it was. It's Brutal. really tough, you know, and that was kind of what we, me and John talked about in the last episode was that it doesn't matter it didn't really matter like how good the women's match was going to be because it was the main event like people were going to be fatigued by the time they got to that match anyway like it was that's just the way it was going to be and that yeah. was a bad thing because people have been sitting there for six and a half hours already just to get to that match but they're going to be tired and, and they want to go home and so it's it's going to negatively kind of impact that match. So it's it's kind of just like the law of diminishing returns, you know? Like, it, if you could have, yeah, for example, you know, you can have your favorite ice cream in front of you. But if that's all you could eat all day, you're going to get real sick of it real shortly. So, uh, and that's kind of, that was, that was kind of WrestleMania for me. It was the law of diminishing returns. I got more excited for the first few matches than the show went on. And I, but I feel that way about a lot of things. I genuinely find the lower mid card and mid card a lot more entertaining than I do the main events. Yeah. I mean, that's been, I feel thing. that way about new Japan and triple a and any promotion I watch, I'm more interested in the mid cards and lower mid cards. Cause I feel like you have more diversity there. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing they've been, you know, that's, that's not just a, like you said, it's not really a WWE thing. You kind of see that a lot. It just, it's just the way it is. You just end up seeing a lot more buzz around the kind of mid card or the tag team scene as opposed to the main event. You know, but um, yeah. Well, let me ask you this: what was what was your favorite match at WrestleMania? Well, because it was the first match, but it, one I was most interested in was uh, Kurt Hawkins and Zack Ryder versus the Revival. I went into that match knowing that it got thrown on last minute, but I thought the storyline was simple and it was effective, and it was kind of you you kind of did get a real underdog feeling for Kurt Hawkins. There was he he played it off so well. Like, when he was in the match by himself, there was this level of uncertainty on his face. Like, you know, like, oh, I was really kind of having to lean on Zach to take care of this, but now he's not in the equation. I'm going to have to try to figure this out on my own. And I don't have a good track record of that. Hmm. I thought it was simple. I thought it was to the point. And I thought the storyline made a lot of sense. Okay. Um, the the multi-men SmackDown tag title was really cool, too. There's a lot of real fun mat moments in there. Yes. Like uh, Cesaro oh. having Ricochet and the big swing for like a full minute. <laughs> that big swing, that warmed my heart. You know what I mean? I'm like, <laughs> now, you know, to me, I'm like, now this is silliness, but it's also good wrestling. You know what I mean? I'm like, yes. I, I am on board with this more than a man grabbing somebody else's crotch. You know? 
This is yeah. this is my day. I, I loved that bit with the big swing because it went on forever. And yeah, and every time someone tried to interrupt Seamus, grabbed <laughs> it, it did like the his like chest clubs to him. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. I thought that was one of my favorite matches of the night, really, because I thought that it was so, just, it was just a solid, a good, solid, fun match. You know. So what are you, what are your feelings on the, the thrown together team of Ricochet and Aleister Black? Oh, um, we are not fans on this podcast. We are not not a, not a big fan of Smiley Happy Flippy Boy and Kiki McDark Soul. Well, uh, fans of them separately, sure. Yes, but together, no. No, because it doesn't make any sense. Like, why? There's would, no, there's no chemistry. <laughs> what are those two guys doing teaming together? You know, like well, and, why? And you can kind of feel like that was probably the spot that Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Gargano were going to be in before Gargano, uh, before Ch- uh, Ciampa's neck got messed up. Well, yes, again, me and John kind of covered this in the last one where, where we said that um, it seemed like you know Ciampa and Gargano were probably going to win the Dusty Classic this year, and you know um, Ciampa got injured, so it it felt like a re- kind of like a like a really like like almost like everything fell into place for them to to really push um, these two guys as a legit tag team. Because before that, nobody was buying it. And then really quickly, you know, the, the Dusty Rhodes Classic happened and people could see that they were a team and they worked together. And then they go straight into WrestleMania for a championship match and, and take over for a championship match. I'm like, okay, the way that they've kind of built it up makes it seem like they are le- like a legit tag team. The only problem is, like, there was absolutely no build-up and there was absolutely no, like... You, you would imagine at some point that one of them would say something to the other one about teaming together. Hey, let's team up. <laughs> yeah, but there was none of that. There was just like, we're a team now. We work great together. And, like, I'm like the, to me, I feel like there would be more conversation about it. You know? Yeah, I mean, and at least conflict, because foils, foils create conflict. You know, Ricochet is very lively, very upbeat, kind of always seems to have a smirk or a smile on his face. And Aleister Black is sort of the uh, the embodiment of a very stoic person. Like, you would expect there to be a little bit of that, I'm not, and I'm not saying they go full this, but a little bit of Al Snow and Steve Blackman. Yes, exactly. You, you want, you, you would imagine there's going to be that kind of um, dichotomy between those two people, and that's, you want to bring that out. Because you want to show that side of them and give them character, you know. Wrestling doesn't make sense sometimes, you know. That's true. Wrestling does not make sense sometimes. Um. Yeah. That's is. Is there anything else you want to kind of cover when it comes to WrestleMania? I think. Um. I. I. I don't want to run the risk of having this podcast last seven hours like WrestleMania did. Um. <laughs> is there any matches that we didn't really cover that you want to cover real quick or? Uh, I mean, we kind of touched base on pretty much all of them. We didn't really say anything about Randy Orton versus uh, AJ Styles. Solid. I mean, that's pretty right. much all I got to say about it. It was solid. It was just it was a fine match, you know. The yeah. Theme across the board, you know, decent decent matches, but nothing spectacular, you know. Did you did you enjoy the return of uh, the Doctor of Thugonomics, John Cena? I gotta say, yes, I did. I, same here. Loved it. The second I heard that music, I got really excited. <laughs> and like it was, it's the same old kind of bullshit. But like for a one-off kind of appearance, you know, for a one one-time thing, you're like, oh, th- that's fair enough. This is kind of what WrestleMania is about, you know, a yeah. celebration of the WWF and its and its heritage. And John Cena and his thug life, you know, Doctor Thugonomics gimmick was pretty big. Um, so I'm like, yeah, that's it's a silly fun thing. That 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 you know has a place at WrestleMania. I had no problem with that, you know. Yeah, I liked it. I thought it was fun. Yeah, and I did too. I will tell you what, I didn't think it was fun, and we kind of covered this earlier. Actually, you know what? I didn't. I didn't hear it. I think I've heard other people say they did hear it. Was um, the Triple H match? No, I have said that it was. It was. It's. It's a typical Triple H match in that it was overly long and very self indulgent. At least a Triple H post uh, Evolution match. The yes. Evolution matches was a lot of Triple H getting his ass whipped and then like him cheating to win. But like I, I've noticed like a lot more like um, Triple H, like you know, kind of around the time that he was becoming a part timer, 
all of his matches started to have the same formula where you know they they're, they're overly long and self-indulgent but they also go in very hot they start off very hot so like the first five minutes of the of the match is gonna be very hot and that means that for the next 20 minutes there's gonna be a lot of selling and a lot of plotting yes like it's like they go in so hot at the beginning that you don't really get a chance to get into the match and so at the point where you normally would get into a match you're just watching guys lying on the floor and you're like this is bad piercing triple h should know better um, and I've noticed him do that a lot with, with matches um, as he's become more of a part-timer. I didn't hate that match because no. because it was what it was. You know, it's just it's what I expected it to be. Um, but again, it was... I will, I will say that we have a, a mutual friend that uh, was speaking about the match. He had very, very negative <laughs> feelings towards it. Yes. <laughs> And uh, he what he stated he stated that Triple H wrestled as a heel throughout the whole match, and he's not totally wrong. No, I mean the thing is, is that yeah, Batista he beat up a seventy year old man, yeah. and then like kind of acted like a coward and wouldn't face Triple H one on one whenever he called him out. So I I can almost get Triple H, you know, being a little a little rough around the edges with him. Yeah. Um, I did think that, I mean, of course he was fake and whatnot, but you know, what? Pull it, yeah, I know. <laughs> pulling out, pulling out Batista's no, nose ring with a pair of needle nose pliers. Mm-hmm. I thought it made for a very interesting visual, but it did, it did come across as incredibly barbaric. <laughs> well, like that, that, that whole storyline didn't make any sense to begin with. Like the build up to that didn't make any sense. Batista says, give me what I want. And Triple H says, no. And Batista says, yes. And then Triple H says, okay, fine. You know, like it's it's. Oh, and then and then it was like, well, you got to put your career on the line. Like, why, why are we negotiating? Right, this? that was another thing. Triple H was like, yeah, okay, we'll fight. And then Benicia said, oh, just one more thing, Mrs. Robinson. Why don't you um, put your career on the line? And then Triple H is like, yes, okay, fine. Like, why, why does any of that make sense? And why Triple H's career, whenever you know he only wrestles two matches a year, and why not Benicia's career as well, even though. That's essentially what I mean, happened. he retired after the fact yes. anyway. Right. So he did it anyway. So you may as well have put that on too. Right? Well, and like, okay, so to case in point, it reminds me of uh, when when Shane McMahon first came back and Vince McMahon said, well, Undertaker, you're going to wrestle my son at WrestleMania. And if you, if you lose, you'll never compete at WrestleMania again. And like one of those hindsight things, like, yeah, maybe he should have lost because he's not been having a great time of it lately. Well, he beat John Cena in like five minutes, right? Yeah, yeah, he, he certainly did. He also looked like he was going to keel over and die at one point. Well, he's a dead man. He's supposed to. <laughs> That's his, he's just, Yeah, he's, you got me there, didn't you? Just keeping gimmicks, you know? Um, so yeah, basically, overall, I, I would give WrestleMania like a, like a solid kind of C, a C plus, maybe, um, I yeah, I mean there wasn't anything there wasn't anything grotesquely wrong, but there was also anything that made me like say this is one people are going to remember forever, which is a shame because you know once again it was the first WrestleMania with all you know with a, a women's title match as the main event, right? But it's just it. I think it was a it came after seven and a half hours, mm-hmm. and there was a weird finish to it that it really should have been a definitive victory for Becky Lynch. Right, like you said, like there's a lot of good things that happened at this WrestleMania, but also they didn't really come as a result of anything spectacular. We got a lot of the good people winning and 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 all that stuff, but like they didn't. None of that came at, at the expense of like a kick-ass fucking match, you know. Um, that's kind of what you want from WrestleMania, especially if it's going to be seven hours long. You kind of want to to watch that real, like, this is awesome match, you know? Yeah, and, well, and, I, and so I, I think the closest contender to that, a lot of people would say, was Daniel Bryan versus Kofi Kingston. Yeah, I mean, I would probably say the matches I enjoyed the most were Daniel Bryan versus Kofi Kingston, um, the women's tag team match, and the SmackDown tag team match. Those are the ones, and the main event as well. But like I said, it, it felt kind of the the flat finish kind of pulled me away from it. If you know yeah. what I mean. If I could find uh, kind of a topic that would kind of close this out, I got a real big sense that I think they're going to keep the brand split, but I think they're going to do away with a lot of those dual titles. 
I mean, because Becky won the women's Raw and women's SmackDown belts. I don't see her defending them separately. Okay. This... I, I could kind of see them unifying that. And on Raw, they teased Kofi Kingston versus Seth Rollins with both belts on the line. I could see them merge those belts, too. Okay, this is something that I definitely wanted to see for a different podcast, but I think that unifying the women's championships is a very bad idea. They have so many women that they deserve to have two two championships, one in each brand. Um, You know, they have so many women that they can't even use half of them right. So they need as many opportunities as they can get. Uh, For them to say that we're, we're, you know, all about women's revolution and giving women a chance to shine, and then for them to take away an opportunity for the women to shine like that seems like a counterproductive and a bad idea. No, I would agree with that, but it's also like if the last few months of of storylines have told us, they seem completely incompetent at building two separate women's storylines. They put all of their eggs in the Ronda, Becky, Charlotte basket that by the time they got to two weeks before WrestleMania, they said, oh, damn, we didn't do anything with Asuka. And they were like, fuck it, give her belt to Charlotte. Right, and again, that's that's totally on them. Like, that's that's a mistake they've made, and, and it's a mistake that they need to capitalize on, on and, and change and fix, because there are, like, a lot of really good women on SmackDown that deserve a shot like that. You can easily have Asuka be, like, the linchpin of that company or of that brand, and have all these other women step up and try and see how good they are, and and you know then you can you can evaluate them and see how good you know like for example um, Carmella and Naomi both have improved an awful lot, um they've done a really good job, and so you know they deserve the kind of shot at a championship just like all the other guys do, but like if they just make it one championship, you're just gonna see Becky versus Charlotte a lot. And that's that's not gonna it's not gonna be good for business. Yeah. Anyway. Well, and that, that kind of goes back to you know um, they need to start diversifying who they use. Yeah. You know, because like I said, their their roster is a lot bigger than just twenty people on one show. Right. And I didn't like this Raw and SmackDown because they there was a lot of bleed over. You know, Drew McIntyre wrestled on both Raw and SmackDown. Yeah, I didn't like that either. That they kind of blurred the lines a lot. I guess I guess it makes sense because they're leading up to the superstar shakeup. My only my only hope is that they actually use that as an opportunity to build up some of these other teams or other competitors that they don't feature primarily right now. Well, good luck with that. Yeah, I know, right? Um, because you know, wrestling doesn't make any sense. I brought it round. You see how I did that? It's very well done. Thank you. I'm getting good at this. Uh, is there anything else you want to say before we wrap this one up? Uh, no, not really. I'm good. Cool. Uh, me too. Basically, WrestleMania was okay. Here's hoping next year's WrestleMania will be better. And that Asuka actually gets a match on it. We shall see. So, yeah. Thanks for listening, guys. Um, we'll see you in the next one. Bye.